adult actor who saw an ad that a zoo was running that they had an opening and he really needed the money and so he went to the zoo to find out what the position was and much to his horror the only position they had open was for someone to impersonate a monkey they said listen it's pretty simple you just got to put on the monkey suit you got to walk back and forth, pace back and forth in the cage, occasionally, you know, swing from one limb to another, and just eat all the bananas and the peanuts that the kids throw at you every day. But we need you. We've got a whole bunch of kids coming tomorrow. We expect a lot of visitors, and we don't have a monkey, and the guy needed the money, so he said, okay, I'll do it. So the next day he showed up, he put on the monkey suit, he started to pace back and forth, swing across a couple branches. After eight hours, though, he started to get nauseous because of all the bananas that he had been eating from the kids, throwing it at him. And so as he's swinging from one branch to another, about to vomit, he slips and he falls into the cage next to him, which just happened to be the lion's cage. So he falls into the lion's cage. The lion starts to slowly approach him. And so he yells out, help, help. The kids are terrified because the monkey's talking now. But, 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 but then as the lion gets closer and closer, he gets right up to his face. And the lion says, shut up or we're both going to lose our jobs. Today's message is called, God is my judge. Open your Bible today to Daniel chapter 6. In today's message, we'll study a story you probably heard in your childhood, but we're not going to study it the way you heard it in your childhood. It is Daniel and the lion's den. And the story opens up with a, in chapter 6 with a new king setting up his personal form of government for Babylon, Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. That's a financial term. Then this Daniel distinguished himself, so he excelled. He, 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 he showed himself to be preferred. Then this, this, this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Uh, from the earlier chapters in this book, we know that Daniel had already distinguished himself time and time again. He's already known as the wisest of the wise and the most capable man in all of Babylon. You see, Daniel had an excellent spirit. Now, notice it's both excellence and spirit. Excellence, beyond average, beyond the norm, something that differentiates, something that makes distinctive. In Aramaic, excellence is yatir, and it means preeminent, surpassing, extremely great, exceedingly abundant. Now remember something, Daniel's, Daniel's a Jew. He's a captive. He's not a native Mede or Persian, and yet he's living in the land of Babylon as a captive. He's an aged Israelite. He's an, he's an old Hebrew gentleman now who just happens to have an excellent spirit. However, where some scholars stop is with excellence. Uh, they point out that Daniel was indeed efficient and uh, effective, administrative. The position that he had as a governor would require him to have financial management over 40 districts. So we can see, no doubt, that Daniel was a leader of leaders. He was a man of competency and character and capability. He had great chemistry with the king. Daniel was a team player. He paid attention to detail. Adversity never phased him. He was a hard worker, a smart worker, both diplomatic and fearless. He was highly intelligent. He was all that. He was a man of exceedingly abundant excellence. And, and, and by the way, that should speak volumes to us. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the Bible says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Don't do things half-heartedly, halfway, dispassionately. 
Colossians 3 says, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Listen, we don't represent Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar or King Darius. We represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We represent King Jesus. So yes, we too, even more so, should be people of excellence. We should be people who are, are, who are earmarked by our competence, by our uncompromising character, by our hard working, our smart working. Watch this. The Bible says in Psalm 16, as for the saints who are on the earth, how many of you know that's us? They are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Listen, we should be known for our creative thinking. We should be known for our adept problem solving. We should be known for how we take the initiative. How we own opportunities. Like we don't take the path of least resistance. We're, we're not looking for shortcuts. We do the hard things because they're hard. We go beyond the bare minimum. Because listen to me, we, we play hurt. We play even when we're sick. You want to know why? Because we're not really playing. This is no joke. This is about destiny. This is about eternity. And that's why we go beyond the mediocre, beyond just doing enough, beyond the paycheck, beyond average. Listen, we're graced with the knowledge and understanding and insight of, and the wisdom of God. We've got the anointing. We've got the distinct advantage of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Listen to me. We should be people who distinguish ourselves, who set ourselves apart, for we're to be the people who know their God are strong and carry out great exploits. You see, our practical excellence, what we do at home, how we conduct ourselves at work, speaks to the excellency of what Jesus has wrought in our lives. And believe me, like your attitude and your actions and your demeanor at work, they speak. I said they speak. I don't know what they're saying, but they speak. Right? Your attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? Our soon coming King Jesus deserves, he deserves to be represented well by ambassadors who conduct themselves with excellence. But that's really just half the picture. Daniel wasn't just a man of excellence, he had an excellent spirit. In biblical, in biblical Aramaic, the word for spirit is ruach. It means spirit, wind, breath. We see that word first appear in the second verse of the entire Bible. We know the Bible begins with, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without, without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God, the wind of God, the breath of God, the ruach of God brooded over the water. When God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, he was nothing but dust until God breathed ruach, his breath, into the very nostrils of Adam. Like I, 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 I always tell the Lord, I always tell him, I say, I say, I'm nothing but dirt without your breath. And this is really what set Daniel apart. He had an excellent spirit, he had a spirit of excellence. Excellence was breathed into him and was being breathed through him by the very breath of God. And this is what differentiated Daniel. This is what differentiated Daniel from all the others. It's what distinguished him. Same was true, for instance, with Joshua and Caleb. All the other spies brought a bad report. God actually called it an evil report. Everybody else was full of doubt and unbelief. Everybody else moaned and groaned and bellyached and complained and criticized. Everyone else saw the adversity as being too big for God, and therefore they were grasshoppers in their own eyes. How many of you know it's one thing if you look like a grasshopper in somebody else's eyes? That sounds like a them problem, but it's a Another thing, when you look like a grasshopper in your own eyes. Joshua and Caleb weren't buying it. They declared that they were well able to go up and slay whatever giants were in their way. Want to know why? Because God made them a promise. 
God's estimation of that kind of courage, of that kind of bravery, of that kind of raw faith. In Numbers chapter 14, God says, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Listen, if you're going to fully follow the Lord, you're going to have to be different. I said, if you're going to fully follow the Lord, you're going to have to be different. You're going to have to swim upstream. You're going to have to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I submit to you today that the different spirit that Caleb had and the excellent spirit that Daniel had is the same spirit that David wrote about and Paul quoted in 2 Corinthians 4 and thir verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak. My family, you have a different spirit. You have an excellent spirit. You have a spirit of faith. You just have to tap into it. You have to believe and speak, is what the scriptures just told us. You believe and you speak. How do you exercise a spirit of faith? How do you exercise a spirit of excellence, a different spirit? You believe and you speak. My family, we believe in the goodness of God. We believe in the unmerited favor of God. We believe his mercies are new every morning. We believe we are accepted in the beloved. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. We believe that we have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. We have the mind of Christ. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. With a spirit of faith we believe and therefore we speak that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing is impossible with God. And all things are possible to them that believe. Because Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That's what we believe. And that's what we speak. Daniel had a different spirit. Daniel had an excellent spirit. He had a spirit of faith. And so do you. You just have to step up and step into it. We'll see that it was, in fact, a spirit of faith that got Daniel out of the lion's den. But it's also what got him in there in the first place. Let's pick it up in verse 4 where it says, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king. That word throng there means to conspire with rage. They conspired with rage before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, which is not true, that's a lie, because Daniel's one of the governors. Daniel doesn't agree to this. It's a lie. All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and the advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing so that, it can be ch so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persia Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the decree. By the way, this is a masterpiece of political deception. Right? These guys are saying, listen, this is all about you, King Darius. This is all about you. Everybody should worship you. Everybody should pray to you. Meanwhile, they know that they're lying to him and they're actually working against his will. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, notice he didn't throw a fit. He didn't go out in the city square. He didn't start a petition. He didn't do any of that. He, just, he went home. 
And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. You see, my family, when you operate with a spirit of excellence, a spirit of faith, uh, there will be a target on your back. There will be a little red dot bouncing around on your head and on your heart. You'll get the negative attention of two different entities. Because you'll be so fruitful, so productive, so changed, you'll be on the receiving end of blessing and the promises of God, and your life will be so impactful in the lives of others that the enemy will hate you for it. Oh, he already hates you. Like, he already loathes your existence. And by the way, isn't it interesting that in 1 Peter chapter 5, the devil is likened to a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But one of the reasons why you become even a bigger target for the enemy when you walk in a spirit of faith is, is because a spirit of faith is magnetic. People with a spirit of faith, they have a gravitational pull. They attract like-minded people. They, they coalesce communities of excellence rather naturally. They pull other people toward the same goal, and more specifically, an excellent spirit draws others to Jesus. So, so, so the enemy hates the possibility of your faith going viral, of God using you to plunder hell to populate heaven. The enemy hates the fact that you might be influencing other people for God or leading other people to the Lord or seeing God's hand on your life. They see God's hand on your life and they wonder why and they ask questions. The enemy hates when that happens. Can I tell you something else? The enemy hates when you invite and bring other people to church. But guess what? He's defeated. I said he's defeated. The devil is a liar. God is on your side. Jesus has already won the victory, and the wicked one, though real, he is a defeated, disarmed, and destroyed foe. Listen, his bark is way bigger than his bite, and if he was a real lion, he'd be a defanged, a deep-toothed lion. He'd be all gums. You want to know why? Because 1 Peter chapter 5 says he's like a lion. He's not a lion. He's like a lion. He's a fake lion. He's a faux lion. He's a poser lion. He impersonates a lion. He wants to be a lion, but that option's not available to him because there's only one lion. There's only one lion. There's only one lion and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah and his name is Jesus the real lion has shut the mouth of the imposter lion but secondly and maybe a little more down to earth uh, remember I said if you conduct yourself like Daniel they'll be with, with an excellent spirit You'll get the negative attention of two entities. Well, it's pretty obvious. Did you see it? Because of Daniel's excellent spirit, here come the haters. The satraps and the other two governors. The self-appointed watchdogs. The gangster bloggers. The IG bullies. The Facebook Pharisees. Because of Daniel's excellent character and the hand of God on his life, the favor of God on his life, the anointing of God on his life. And apparently, apparently the king's desire to promote him over the whole thing, that information has leaked. So here come the haters, jealous, envious, covetous people conspiring to create chaos and outrage. So look at verse 4 again. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Unfortunately for the haters, Daniel's behavior conforms to his spotless reputation. They will have to manufacture a fault in his personality. 
How many of you know we live in a world that now manufactures faults every day? But I have to tell you, their hate is too late. I said their hate is too late. Daniel has an excellent spirit. He has a track record, a stellar track record. God is with him. How many of you know the hate is too late? And the same is true for you. God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You're complete in him. Christ in you is the hope of glory. You are sufficient in Jesus' all sufficiency. You are enough in his enoughness. And he is more than enough. You as a believer in Jesus Christ are a body filled and flooded with God himself. And you are already blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When it comes to you, you're already accepted. You're already favored. You already have everything you'll ever need and more. The, the haters hate is too late. Now notice they couldn't find fault because Daniel was what? Because he was really smart? Because he was really gifted? Because he had an amazing personality? No, they couldn't find fault because Daniel was faithful. The Bible says a faithful man will abound with blessing. And I know when we hear the word faithful, uh, you know, some of our traditional understandings of, uh, understandings of that word, and they are accurate understandings, and they are important elements, but understand this, when we see the word faithful, we, use it, we, we think of loyal, and yet guess what, Daniel was loyal. We think of trustworthy, very important, Daniel was certainly trustworthy. When we see the word faithful, we think of committed. And Daniel was all in, legitimately committed. Not the watered down version of the word commitment that we hear today. But every time you see the word faithful in the Bible, it also means full of faith. The original languages carry with it the idea that of being full of faith. So yes, Daniel was loyal. He was committed, he was honest, and he wholeheartedly trusted in the nature and the ability and the power and the character of his God. And that's why when the haters partially fulfill their plan and they get Darius to sign the decree, guess what? Daniel's not moved. He's not moved. He doesn't curl up in the fetal position and pull the covers over his head. He doesn't lash out. He doesn't self-diagnose and self-medicate. He's stable. He's steadfast. He's emotionally balanced. He's not moved. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times the day, that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Daniel is not moved. Daniel did what he always did. In the midst of adversity and impending doom, Daniel didn't run from God. He just did what he always did. His response is simple. He goes home. He goes upstairs, prays with the windows open toward Jerusalem. That is a picture of balance. Listen, he's not flaunting his faith, but he's not hiding it either. There's no speech. There's no inner turmoil. Daniel is unflinchingly obedient. He doesn't question, doubt, worry. He acts. He doesn't bow toward Darius, but toward Jerusalem. Darius is neither the object nor the mediator of his prayers. That role is taken by Yahweh. And as an aside, can I just tell you, that role is taken in your life too. St. Christopher is not your mediator. St. Bartholomew is not your mediator. St. Patrick, St. Joseph nor Mary is your mediator as far as the Bible is concerned. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 
The role of mediator in your life has been taken by the only one who paid the price. That role is taken by Jesus. But I think it will be instructive for us to, go, to take a more granular look at Daniel's prayer habit. And by the way, it was a habit. Did you see it? It's a habit. Something he did consistently, regularly, for years. He goes to an upper room, so he has a set place where he prays. On his knees. A posture of humility and dependence upon God. He does it three times a day. Three is a prime number. What does that mean? A prime number is one that is only divisible by itself and the number one. So, not, so three is a number of unity. Specifically in the Bible, it's a number of tri-unity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Soul, and Body. Three times a day speaks both of Daniel's undivided heart towards God and his oneness with his people who are captives with him. Which brings me actually to the detail I like the most, the most interesting and meaningful detail to me of Daniel's prayer. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees. So he's literally looking towards his real home. A beloved city that was in ruins. His people's home, Jerusalem. A place he was taken from when he was 16 years old. And now he's an octogenarian. Now he's 80 plus years old. Think about that. Th to think about if, 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 if a foreign army came in and invaded New Jersey. And just destroyed New Jersey and just took it to the ground. Made it in just smoldering ruins. And then took us in chains off to a foreign land. Changed our names. We couldn't use our name anymore. And we couldn't speak English anymore. We had to speak their language. How many of you know you'd long for home? I said you'd long for home. But figuratively, it's even more than that. Jerusalem, Jerusalem's always been known as the heart of the Jewish people. Israel became a nation in 1948, but it was said that they still didn't have their heart until they regained Jerusalem in 1967. So Daniel was literally opening the windows of his house towards his true earthly home. But he was figuratively opening up his heart to his ultimate home. Daniel was literally doing that. My family, that's a beautiful picture that every one of us should adopt and apply. That we hit our knees. That we hit our knees and we un unashamedly fling open the windows. We lift our hands and we open up our hearts continually, daily, in an uncompromisingly undivided and ever-widening way. Let's pick up the story in verse 11 where it says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the, into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That uh, Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. And set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Hmm. Third observation concerning Daniel in the lion's den is found in, in what is not written. What, what's not recorded, what's not said. Because Daniel grew confident and courageous in quietness. The satraps and the governors, they come together three times. 
deceptively lying to the king. Then they stalk Daniel as he's praying. And then they interrupt the king to tell him about Daniel's devotion. And, and again, when, the, when it says the accusers assembled, the word in, in Aramaic is ragash. And it means to come together excitedly, tumultuously, noisily, disrespectfully, in an uproar. And Daniel's silent every time. After Daniel prays, we don't hear a word from him until after the lion's den. And I believe this is the key to navigating your way through being afraid and being brave at the same time. Ready? <laughs> David Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. He said, faith is a refusal to panic. It's a refusal to panic. Listen, don't let the noise panic you. Don't let the noise on social media, don't let the noise online, don't let the noise on the news, don't let the noise from your neighbor, don't let it panic you. Don't let the noise make you anxious, make you afraid, make you doubt yourself, make you doubt your God. Listen, Daniel is an example of faith under duress, faith under pressure, and he's silent before his accusers. He's silent before the king. He doesn't panic, not even in the lion's den. Let's face it, King Darius is about to have a worse night than Daniel. So how does Daniel do it? Isaiah 30, verse 15, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. Ready? In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Listen to me, when everybody else is foaming at the mouth, when everybody else is up in arms, when everybody else is running around like a chicken with their head cut off, when everybody else is complaining about corporate or the boss, when everybody else is freaking out about the government and politics, when everybody's all lathered up about the economy, exercise quiet confidence in your God. And when everybody tries to rope you into their mess, say no thank you and stay quiet and confident in your God. Even when facing lions, <laughs> even when the adversity is like hungry and growling, even when you find yourself the target of false accusations and thoroughly fabricated criticisms, listen, the Bible says being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible says cast not away your confidence, which has great reward. In 1910, Teddy Roosevelt begins his famous speech in Paris. And by the way, it's a quote I have personally tucked away and I use it whenever necessary. He begins his speech with these words, ready? It is not the critic who counts. Will you say it with me today? It is not the critic who counts. Say it again. It is not the critic who who regardless of who those critics are. If it's an envious coworker, like you get promoted because you have an excellent spirit, listen, it is not the critic who counts. If it's a false friend, a frenemy, right? Somebody who's jealous of the hand of God on your life, the favor that surrounds your life. Listen, it is not the critic who counts. Even, and I know this is hard, but I know it's going to hit home with a lot of us. Even if it's a family member who's critical of you and they belittle you and they disrespect you and they try to put you down. They try to eat away at your sense of self-worth. They've targeted you for hypocritical fault finding. In other words, they're searching for a speck in your eye when they got a log in their own eye. Especially concerning how you're blessed and, how, and your devotion for God. How he's transforming your life. Listen, your ever brightening light is exposing their darkness. Well, guess what? Their harsh criticisms, their out of bounds put downs, their gossip do not count. So just be free of all that today. Okay, so let's finish the story. In verse 16, we'll go all the way to verse 28. Verse 16 says, so the king gave command. 
And they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, uh, 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 your, your, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Oh, thanks for that, as you're throwing me into the lions. Thanks, thanks for that encouragement. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of his lords, and, the per and that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no mus with no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, D -d 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 Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O oh, king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury was found on him. Watch this. Because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel. Oh, you better watch out. Oh, you better watch out. Oh, watch out for that boomerang, right? Right, they brought the men who accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives, oh snap, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Watch this, before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, oh he's ready to write now, ready? Then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my, of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and his works, he works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. <laughs> I mean, wow, wow. You know, I like to read the Bible like I never read it before. I think that's a key to being just blown away and amazed. Like, wow. Like, this is a thoroughly pagan king. He, this is a king who was told by his top men that he is a god to be prayed to and worshipped. But because of Daniel, because of Daniel's character and excellence and spirit of faith, because of the very obvious miraculous power of God that's working in him and for him and through him, this pagan king sets forth an unprecedented decree that the God of Daniel, the God of Israel, Elohim, is the one and only true and living God. My family, if this story communicates anything, here's what it communicates to us. Despite present appearances, God is indeed in control. And in our world, where everything and everyone is increasingly out of control, how many of you know it's good to know that despite present appearances, God is in control? Now for those who say, well, you know, maybe the lions were sleeping all night. Well, you need to catch up on your Nat Geo because lions are nocturnal. They're awake all night long. And somebody else says, well, you know, maybe, maybe the lions weren't hungry. Maybe the lions were Oh, why don't you ask Daniel's accusers if the lions were hungry because they ate them before they could hit the floor. Regardless of the fact that powerful political forces moved against Daniel, God preserves him from their clutches. In spite of the fact 
that the law of the Medes and the Persians has condemned him to death? How many of you know God preserved his life? Regardless of the fact that the lions are hungry, God does not allow them to even scratch Daniel's skin. Man, our puppies do more to us than that. Listen, God overrules the evil intentions of jealous and envious human beings to bring about his plan, purpose, and goodwill. God indeed is in control. And as we look back, as we look back, like we not only have an example in Daniel, but we have a Savior in Jesus. See, your confidence is made even more sure. You see, just as Daniel was framed on false charges by envious leaders, so was Jesus. Just as Daniel was arrested while praying in the privacy of his home, Jesus was arrested by praying while praying in the privacy of a garden. Both Daniel and Jesus were turned over to be arrested. But here's the big difference. Daniel emerges without a scratch, whereas Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. And the chastisement for our peace was laid upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Daniel emerged without a scratch, but Jesus died for us. Daniel comes out of a den filled with lions, but Jesus resurrects out of an empty tomb after having emerged from hell itself. And that's why Daniel is a great example, but Jesus is a great Savior. But here's the secret. Here's the secret of, uh, uh, of Daniel and the lion's den. Here's the secret of Daniel's, really his amazingly blessed life as a whole. And it's my final thought today. Uh, as it often is in biblical studies, the secret is in Daniel's God-given name. Daniel's name, Daniel, means God is my judge. Now say it for yourself today, ready? God is my judge. Say it again like you mean it. God is my judge is my judge. No other person on earth. No demon in hell. Only God is my judge. And my judge has put my penalty on another. He's declared me innocent. He's cleared me of all charges. He says I'm not only cleared of all guilt, but I'm actually now righteous before him. The only one. The only one. I said, the only one who has the right to judge me has taken my place. He's paid my penalty. He served my sentence so that I could go free. Who cares what the haters say? Who cares what the critics spew? God is my judge. He has the last word. He makes all the calls. He calls all the shots. And he loves you with an everlasting love. And if the government enacts ridiculous laws, and if the government persecutes you, and rulers can't rescue you, everything is going to be all right. You want to know why? God is your judge. He's both just and the justifier of them who walk in a spirit of faith. He makes a way where there is no way. He makes rivers through the desert. He makes a highway through the sea. No matter what den you get thrown in, no matter how loud the lions may roar, God is your judge.